Hola, buenos días a todos. Y... Hey, good morning everyone and welcome to this first edition of um, Echo Long Summit. We are going to start a webinar which has been organized by the Echo Foundation where a group of experts, national and international experts, as you can see, a prom some prominent figures from the scientific standpoint will discuss in detail very relevant aspects in the field of IO and lung cancer, such as the sequence of treatment, the role of biomarkers, the duration of treatment, as well as uh, certain research lines in the field of IO. Sadly, once again, uh, given the pandemic we are amidst, we haven't been able to organize this uh, session um, on site as we would have loved, obviously. But thanks to the new uh, ICPs, we have been able to organize this in a virtual mode and we will be able to um, organize this uh, live streaming. And I hope the session will uh, go smoothly with no technical um, inconveniences so we can enjoy from home, from our offices, uh, from these wonderful presentations the speakers have prepared for all of us on a new therapeutic era, which is uh, impactful to us as oncologists and the rest of our patients, obviously, because um, what's certain, and nobody doubts now, that uh, immunotherapy has entailed a radical transformation in the paradigm in the uh, uh, treatment of cancer. Uh, it is clear now that immunotherapy is at the moment a fundamental um, weapon in the treatment against cancer whose security and sa safety is clearly proven. And that's the reason why it's part of our daily therapeutic weaponry. And obviously every day we get to know much more all those molecular mechanisms involved in the immuni uh, uh, immunitary process of cancer, we are more and more familiar with the different drugs and their combinations and ever uh, now uh, we uh, deal with a I uh, IAs better and we uh, have uh, taken solid steps in uh, the knowledge of the resistance of these drugs. There are three fundamental aspects that feature these drugs. A. Uh, a percentage of uh, patients, which is even growing today, uh, managed to uh, ensure um, big OS. Uh, it's unthinkable um, of a PFS uh, of five years with uh, metastatic uh, lung cancer patients. And we wouldn't have think of that. And now some, some of these patients are healed. The second, uh, feature of these type of drugs is that unfortunately it does not benefit all the patients and um, thirdly the cost is very high and uh, obviously this uh, um, hindrances its aspects of benefits and in a field of crisis like the one we will probably live in the years to come around Europe that's the reason why we need to look for prognostic and uh, predictive biomarkers, which allow us to understand which patients can benefit and which ones cannot, which ones will benefit from IO and in monotherapy, and which patients will benefit more from a combo in uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy and IO plus IO. Therefore, broadly speaking, um, it is important to identify the biomarkers which will help us on the one hand, to extend and optimize the treatment with these drugs, but on the other hand, to contribute, reduce the cost uh, to the national healthcare system. From the ECHO Foundation, we have always um, made sure we uh, were given our contribution in order to move forward and reach excellence in oncology with uh, programs that give support to um, healthcare and research. And in that, amidst this context, we believe that the training programs like this one are most valuable, not only for the topics introduced, but also because of the very high prominent figures that we are going to count with today. Um, a dynamic specialty like ours really requires a constant update of all the knowledge, of the scientific knowledge. And uh, every occasion is good to say that we strongly believe we need even 
a change in the uh, healthcare organization that shall work in a network in order to make sure that all patients suffering from cancer can gain access to the molecular uh, benefits and the most adequate and pertinent drugs. I am certain, obviously, that we are now just uh, beginning this therapeutic area and uh, the next improvements in the knowledge of uh, um, cancer immunology and the development of new drugs will bring us uh, very relevant improvements and uh, steps forwards in the treatment of cancer and will certainly contribute to improve the healing possibilities, thus increasing uh, OS and quality of life uh, of our patients. The session obviously aims at um, offering an update of the status quo of immunotherapy in lung cancer and it is aimed at becoming a forum for debate and discussion that allows us to identify critical aspects in order to improve the assist uh, the attendance quality uh, we have a prominent panel of experts uh, worldwide recognized and i highly encourage you to be very active in the uh, discussions thus asking as many questions as you may wish which will obviously enrich the scientific level of this meeting after the session i hope that we can uh, go back home with a more broader holistic view fully updated of the wonderful moment we are living from the ophthalmological point of view facing lung cancer Lastly, to conclude, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all speakers for their efforts for being here today, connected, uh, especially those from other countries, Marina Garasino from Milan, Antonio Raujo from Portugal, Porto, Amaya Gottfried from Israel, uh, Federico Capuzzo from Italy, and Carlos Cordon, who is going to connect in the afternoon from New York. So I'd like to uh, send them a very warm greeting and thanking them for the enormous effort for being here today. And uh, to conclude, I would like to thank especially uh, the entire pharmaceutical industry that has heavily contributed in the sponsoring of, of this um, uh, uh, event. Um, who, without their collaboration, this event would not have been possible. Without further ado, we are going to start these uh, talks and hopefully at the end of the day, this is going to be a very fruitful session. Thank you very much indeed. I wish you a very fruitful session. And I will leave the floor to Mariana Provencio, the chair of the Spanish Institute of Lung Cancer, so he can start the scientific uh, seminar. Good morning, everyone, and I wish you a very bueno, buenos días a todos. Session. La verdad es que es un uh, placer estar aquí. Muchas gracias a la Fundación ECO por la invitación y por organizar este evento, que yo creo que es muy completo. Y, y bueno, tenemos ponentes, como ha dicho el doctor Guillén, realmente extraordinarios. A mí me toca la gran oportunidad, el gran honor de presentar al profesor Capucho el extenso currículum que creo que no es muy conocido en el ámbito oncológico. Él es director de, el, en, de, de Oncología Médica del Instituto Nacional de Cáncer de Regina Elena en Roma. Ha estado en distintos sitios como en South Carolina, en Denver, y se formó también en Rusia y tiene es autor de más de 200 artículos articles uh, in, in, in different prominent journals around the world. De, eh, He's going to talk to us about la transmisión um, genética uh, y el impacto del COVID um, en, en COVID pacientes con cáncer de pulmón, que sabemos todos, uh, realmente es una gran preocupación. Tenemos estadísticas de mortalidad en pacientes con cáncer de pulmón y COVID, uh, estamos preocupados. Italia y España han sido Italy unos ejes de la pandemia que nos ha asolado y que nos sigue asolando. En la sesión que tenemos abierta, por favor, select el mundo. And please do select the Spanish channel, okay, in the translation ¿Dónde? channel. Mariana Provencia, please go to the, the circle, which represents the uh, globe. Select Spanish, please. No, just continue, okay, everything is fine now. 
Sorry for the interruption. Capuzzo is going to talk to us about the COVID-19, the impact of the infection in lung cancer patients, which is uh, worrisome to most of our patients with very high mortality complications. And we are going to uh, enjoy his uh, talk. Thank you very much, Federico, for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for, uh, for, uh, for the kind invitation. And uh, I think it's uh, very uh, difficult during this time to have meetings uh, in person. is impossible, we know. And fortunately, we have this uh, uh, possibility to meet uh, virtually, as uh, Guglielmo said uh, in uh, his uh, introduction. So what I will uh, give you is not a classical lecture, because uh, I try to share with you also the experience that we are living here in Italy with our patients and, of course, with the pandemic that we have. Of course, I present you some data coming from, from some studies. I don't know if I can control the, um, okay, the screen and I can move the slides. Okay. So the uh, first question that we have, of course, is uh, how COVID is impacting uh, the management uh, of patients with, uh, with lung cancer. And of course, uh, this is uh, really deeply impacting on the way in which uh, we are uh, um, uh, hospitalizing the patients uh, and also in, is impacting on all the procedures for the patients and the therapists. Uh, these are probably some of the procedures that many hospitals worldwide are uh, applying. Uh, and this is specifically what we are doing in Italy, where uh, before uh, uh, admitting any patient, uh, we conduct a specific uh, uh, pre-triage, generally by phone. And also, we, uh, um, uh, we uh, avoid that... Uh, uh, families or friends of the of our patients can access to the hospital. This is creating some problems, particularly in the case of patients with a severe condition, in which, of course, generally the family want to try to stay more close to the patient, and we cannot allow that the family can see directly the patient. So this is creating some problem because of course the family is asking to see the patient and we have to deny the access to the hospital. I personally, I'm receiving a lot of phone call even from some people asking me to allow that somebody can go visiting the patient. But of course this is not possible because there is a very high risk that we have a contamination of our department simply because of somebody from outside that is a potential infected that come inside to the hospital. Of course, what is changing is also patient management because uh, uh, we are uh, clearly promoting uh, patient education. Uh, we are giving uh, some advice in uh, how to reduce the risk of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, having the, uh, the, the uh, contact with the virus. And also we are promoting specifically in our institution, but this is something that many other institutions in Italy are doing, an extensive uh, anti-flu vaccination uh, uh, information. So we are convincing all our patients uh, to receive a vaccination about uh, on uh, a standard uh, flu, because uh, we know that in this way we contribute to reduce at least some confounding factors that we can have in our patients. And of course, this is an impact on treatment decision because um, we are observing that uh, in some way, even uh, if uh, the doctor is not really conscious about that, but generally we are trying to offering uh, therapies uh, to patients that are more in good clinical condition. So in some way, frail patients that in the past were candidate in any case uh, to some treatment. At this time, we are offering probably less treatment to frail patients. So we are trying to reduce the risk for the patient. We are trying to give less risky therapies. So we are giving certainly 
priority, for example, for oral therapies, for oral drugs. And also we are uh, modifying the way in which we are approaching the patients. Uh, for giving you a practical example, uh, when we uh, treat patients particularly with, with target therapies, uh, we need to collect tissue from the patient. So we need to repeat the tumor biopsies. These procedures uh, during this period uh, certainly has been reduced. We are offering less uh, this approach. We are more, much more favoring, for example, liquid biopsy. And liquid biopsy is uh, certainly a uh, procedure that will increase the usage of liquid biopsy, certainly will increase uh, in the future. And the COVID infection is uh, also uh, increasing uh, the uh, approach, uh, the usage of uh, this uh, specific uh, of this specific approach. And finally, of course, we had uh, clearly an impact on inclusion in clinical trials. Uh, that was particularly evident uh, during the phase one of the pandemic, in which uh, many centers uh, didn't en enroll patients in clinical trials. Now that we are in phase two of the pandemic, that probably is much more severe than phase one, but because probably we are more uh, familiar with all the procedures for managing pa patients uh, during this, uh, uh, this uh, particular situation, the uh, enrollment in clinical trial uh, in uh, many centers in Italy is going uh, relatively well and we have less impact on enrollment in clinical trial. But certainly the possibility of, in of enrolling patients in clinical trial has been reduced uh, during uh, the uh, pandemia. One of the most uh, important aspect uh, is, of course, uh, treatment of patients. Because uh, when we look at the uh, options that we have today in uh, patients with lung cancer, we know that in patients with lung cancer, uh, we, in oncogen addicted patients, we are offering uh, target therapies. In patients non-oncogen addicted, uh, we are generally offering uh, immunotherapy as a single agent, particularly in patients with uh, high levels of pdl one expression or in combination with, uh, with chemotherapy. And now chemoimmunotherapy also is the new standard of care, not only in non-small cell lung cancer, but also in small cell lung cancer. So even in small cell lung cancer, we know that the chemoimmunotherapy is the best therapy we can offer in, uh, in advanced disease. So the question, of course, is uh, what should we do during the pandemia? Is uh, safe uh, to uh, give uh, immunotherapy? Because uh, certainly, we have many questions in, uh, in this situation. First of all, uh, the first question we have with immunotherapy specifically is uh, if uh, drugs that are uh, able to activate immune system can protect against the infection. We don't have any specific answer for that. We don't know, but we cannot, uh, we cannot say that there is a, a protective effect or there is a negative effect of immunotherapy. So patients that receive immunotherapy in some way are more uh, uh, also um, uh, sen uh, sensitive, can contract the infection more easily. We don't have uh, specifically this question, uh, with this uh, answer to this question. Or also importantly, considering that many of the events that uh, are present in a patient's COVID positive, particularly the pneumonia that we have during the infection is in some way similar on the lung toxicity that we observe in patients treated with immunotherapy. Of course, the question is whether immunotherapy in some way can increase the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, patients uh, uh, during infected with uh, COVID. And of course, uh, what is the mortality during uh, immunotherapy? We don't have a specific uh, uh, answer to all of these questions, but we have some guidelines uh, helping us in our clinical practice to take in some decision. And these are data coming specifically from some ESMO guidelines that uh, 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 in which uh, all of this aspect has been analyzed and based on the data we have today, there is uh, no reason to preclude the usage of immunotherapy in lung cancer patients during uh, the uh, pandemic. Uh, we can use uh, certainly immunotherapy, single agent or in combination with chemotherapy. What is recommended is a very accurate patient selection because we know that all clinical trials with immunotherapy has been done in patients in good clinical condition. So what is recommended is to treat 
we, according to guidelines, all patients that are potentially candidate to immunotherapy. Of course, we can also adapt in some way our strategy by, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, stopping the treatment in patients uh, after a long term of efficacy. There, is a, there are many questions on what is the optimal duration of immunotherapy. We don't know exactly what is the best duration of treatment, but in many trials, uh, immunotherapy was stopped after two years. This is what we can do, certainly, in, uh, during, uh, during this uh, period for reducing the access, the necessity that the patient come to the hospital. And of course, uh, in the case of a, a discontinuation, we can also uh, delay the, uh, the uh, reintroduction of uh, immunotherapy. These are some of the approaches that we can use in our, in our practice for immunotherapy. For target therapies, this is um, what is uh, generally recommended, so to increase uh, what we call telemedicine, or also the possibility to deliver the drug at home of the patient, and specifically in our institution here in Rome, we have a program that allow us to, uh, uh, to, um, to give the drug directly at home to the patient. And also, there are some companies, some pharma companies, that are providing additional help to the hospital for uh, uh, delivering uh, the treatment directly at home to the patient. In this way, we can reduce the necessity that the patient come to the hospital. And this is, of course, much more safe for the patient, but also, of course, for the other patients and doctors in the hospital. This is uh, one of the pictures from uh, one of our patients. Uh, and uh, when we saw this patient that was treated with immunotherapy, of course, uh, our uh, question was uh, if uh, that was... Uh, toxicity by immunotherapy was COVID. And uh, at the end, uh, when we completed all the analysis in these patients, we figured out that these patients unfortunately had a COVID infection. But you can see from this picture that really is difficult in clinical practice uh, to distinguish between uh, uh, toxicity from immunotherapy and COVID. And this is an important uh, an important uh, uh, condition, an important uh, situation that, of course, uh, uh, impact uh, in the management of uh, our patients. I want to show you also some uh, uh, data on our own experience, because uh, in Italy, uh, many, many investigators uh, conducted uh, some uh, analysis uh, on uh, uh, the potentiality of, of, uh, of the usage of some drugs that interfering with, with uh, what we call uh, the uh, cytokine storm, uh, including, uh, uh, for example, uh, tocilizumab. There are some uh, studies that are globally negative with this agent. We did a similar experience with canakimumab. And uh, in our experience, of course, we don't have any control arm. But anyway, we observed that this agent could in some way help patients in improving the, uh, the outcome uh, during the COVID infection. I would just want to remember that canakimumab is an anti-interleukin-1 agent. And that this agent is uh, actively under investigation in lung cancer in the adjuvant setting, as well as in metastatic uh, uh, disease. Uh, this is uh, very important uh, because uh, uh, we are very familiar with this agent uh, and potentially together with an antineoplastic effect, uh, we can have also some positive effect in COVID management. Of course, we need some additional data in uh, this specific setting. I just want to also show you some data on uh, what we can, we can, we consider today the biggest uh, experience that we have in the field of COVID, uh, of lung cancer management during the COVID pandemic. That is the Teravolt experience. I don't know if uh, uh, I saw that one of the speaker that is uh, in, uh, in these uh, meetings that you have is also Marina Garassino leading this uh, in very important experience. So the first analysis uh, was uh, conducted uh, in mainly in, the, in only in the first uh, 200 patients, uh, in, uh, including uh, mainly European patients with a very small follow-up, only 15 uh, uh, days. And uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, initial uh, analysis, uh, in the multivariate analysis, uh, showed that uh, only age uh, is... Uh, is, uh, was associated with an increased risk of mortality. But additional data were uh, 
subsequently presented during the ASCO meeting and also additional updates were also presented in the following meetings. I show you some of the data during the ASCO in which also other uh, uh, population also coming from other centers, particularly from the US uh, were included in uh, this analysis and many of the potential association with the anti-cancer therapy lines of treatment were included in this analysis. So this is just the distribution of the patients that were analyzed in the terrible trial. You can see that the majority of countries were included. Europe was very well represented and also US, South America, Australia, China. So many countries were uh, included in this uh, very important uh, analysis. And when we look to the uh, demographic uh, characteristic of the patients, uh, you can see that this is uh, uh, generally what we can also observe in uh, clinical trials. So we are not talking about patients in uh, bad clinical condition because uh, generally here patients included were patients with a performance status of zero or uh, one. So generally patients uh, in uh, uh, not uh, uh, with, uh, um, uh, with a situation with, with a bad uh, performance status. Also, in terms of, uh, um, uh, of uh, treatment, uh, you can see here that we are talking treatment and also stage. All patients were very well represented, including small cell lung cancer and no small cell lung cancer, and almost all stages of lung cancer were included in uh, this specific analysis. This is just a picture of the treatment that the patients were receiving during the last three months before the observation. And you can see here that patients were a consistent proportion of patients were uh, treated with chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and also with uh, uh, target uh, therapies. And there is uh, no huge difference in between patients recovered, that died, and patients uh, in the hospital. Also, the, when we analyze the data according uh, to some of the uh, most important parameters in as useful for assessing the impact of the outcome of the patients, the age, the presence of comorbidities and performance status were significantly associated with worse outcome of uh, these patients. Uh, and uh, you can see here the outcome according uh, to, the, um, to the, the, the cause of the mortality that was present in this population, that was 35%. So probably uh, this data indicates that this population is more sensitive and more at risk of dying because of the infection. And probably this is one of the most important messages. When we perform a multivariate analysis, uh, factors like age, uh, low performance status, uh, and uh, um, also treatment uh, in influence the outcome of the disease. So the, the, of course we need to consider very cautiously this data because uh, I don't think it's a surprise that the outcome of patients uh, with lung cancer is worse when the performance status is bad and uh, in uh, elderly patients because this is something that is, we already know and this is a clear prognostic factor. But in any case, the most important message in general from this study is that in a patient with lung cancer, we cannot exclude that uh, there is a, a more sensitivity and more risk for dying, not only for the disease, unfortunately, but also, of course, because of the infection. So these patients are more sensitive and more at risk for complication for COVID infection. So in conclusion, uh, <coughs> certainly, the COVID-19, uh, the pandemic is uh, changing our life because now we are adopting uh, uh, many procedures, including isolation, distance, protections, uh, and of course is increasing uh, the risk for the patient. Is increasing the risk of patients because we have a direct risk because of the infection, but also we have an indirect risk because these patients have less access to many procedures uh, that are related to the treatment of the disease, including staging procedures, including surgery, including the possibility to receive uh, an appropriate uh, treatment. And of course, uh, the only solution, uh, we already know that uh, the only solution probably is an active therapy and probably vaccination against COVID is really, really a very urgent need that we have. 
So thank you. I, I don't know if there is any specific question. Bueno, muchas gracias, eh, Federico, por la exposición. No sé si hay preguntas. Thank you very much, Federico, for your presentation. I don't know if there are questions from the audience. I, I'm not seeing any question. I had a question. Are you seeing patients with more advanced disease, major compression, for example? For example, cardiologists are seeing aortic ruptures or dissections, more advanced pathologies than usual because patients are not going to the ER. Are you seeing this in your centers in oncology? Federico? Yes, no, I, I didn't capture your question, sorry. Ah, uh, que si estáis viendo... The question is whether you're seeing more advanced uh, pathologies, patients with more advanced uh, diseases that you've never seen. I mean, the situation of the disease, maybe more inflammatory cancer, a more major compression, for example, or not? Well, I, I guess that I understood your question. Sorry, because I, I expected the question in English and you addressed the question in Spain. So in Spanish, ah. so I didn't expect ah, that. Ah, ah. I'm really sorry. No, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So no problem at all. No, uh, yes, uh, the, this is the risk that we are seeing. Uh, this is what I'm observing in uh, here in uh, uh, now I moved uh, in Rome, so now I'm not in Ravenna, I moved in Rome. Uh, so at the beginning, my idea was that the different population that I was seeing here was also related to my moving. But in effect, I think that uh, the increased number of advanced diseases that I'm seeing here is really also one of the effects of the pandemic. Because uh, for uh, several months, these patients, they had limited access to the hospital. So also the diagnosis was delayed. What we are seeing now are patients with a, a delay in diagnosis. And I think this is the most important problem that we have. I'm not, uh, I don't have too much uh, concern around uh, screening in general, because uh, for screening, uh, the timing uh, is, remains still short. But I have concern for patients with metastatic disease, because in these patients, a delay in diagnosis, of course, impacts dramatically on the possibility to obtain and to receive an effective treatment. And this is what we are observing. At least this is what I'm observing in my practice. And I think this is something happening also in other countries. Sí. Sí, nosotros est estamos viendo... Eh, yes. Eh, menos enfermos. We are seeing less new patients and there must be somewhere. I'll ask the question. So shall I ask the question in English, in Spanish? the uh, congestion problems in sorry do you have uh, reference centers to save uh, congestion problems in hospital by covid or not no i mean our hospital is not a covid hospital so we and also we don't have the emergency uh, department here so we are just a cancer center so we see patients only uh, with cancer. So, the, but of course, the, uh, what we have uh, here, unfortunately, we had some cases of uh, patients with COVID infection that were detected uh, in our hospital. Also, we had, uh, before my arrival, uh, the, in our uh, um, oncology unit, uh, we had um, really many cases of uh, uh, patients infected and also doctors and nurses, uh, that was a problem. Also, when I was in Ravenna, we had uh, uh, the, the problem that uh, nine out of 15 patients uh, hospitalized in our, in our unit uh, had a COVID infection, even if we, we were not a COVID hospital. So I think this is a problem that unfortunately 
is not uh, <laughs> is not only for a general hospital. This is also a problem that we have everywhere, including a cancer center where we have access only to select the patients. Of course, uh, this is the reason why we are getting some specific procedures to reduce the risk that some infected people can arrive to our hospital. But of course, we cannot avoid everything. It's really, really a big problem. And uh, the risk of infection uh, in every hospital is very high at this point. Mm -hmm. No veo ninguna pregunta más. Uh, I didn't see any other question. What was the, the main uh, or the pr uh, primary endpoint in this uh, clinical trial, the oxygen requirement or? Well, uh, this is, was not really a clinical trial because uh, we uh, was uh, uh -huh. just, uh, that was a retrospective uh, um, um, uh, analysis of the patients that we treated uh, in uh, in Romagna, so when I was in uh, Ravenna, ah. uh, because uh, uh, at that time we had no specific drug for COVID uh, and uh, we had the preliminary data with tocilizumab. Uh, Kanakimov was also effective on the same pathway, so I asked to Novartis to give us the drug for treating for compassionate use of these patients. And of course, at the same time, we collected all the, the clinical data. So it was not really a prospective trial. I mean, it was not formally really a prospective trial. But anyway, it was important for us to obtain some information on the duration of uh, the hospitalization, the, that rate. And of course, we also analyzed the effect on respiratory function in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, the capacity, of course, of patients to um, the, some, considering some uh, um, uh, oxygenation parameters and also the, uh, the type of ventilation that the patients required because we observed specifically that some patients started the treatment while they were on, uh, uh, for example, on a uh, ventilation. They needed some, some ventilation and after the treatment, they recovered very fast. Of course, it's impossible to say that was, uh, that was really related to the drug or simply was the outcome of the disease. I am not also expert in infectious diseases, so I cannot say that. That was just uh, an empirical observation that we did. We tried to give our uh, support, our contribution to the uh, medical community in uh, fighting this disease. That was uh, just our contribution. I mean, I don't pretend at all uh, to be expert in the field of COVID management because I treat lung cancer patients. Um, sí, Vicente. Vicente, por, fa por favor, actives el micrófono. Okay, now, yes, Dr. Capuzzo, we know that the cancer patient has a worse prognosis for COVID infection, but do you think that the cancer patient, the tumor, sorry, I, 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 are really a high risk patient for cancer infection? I cannot say that the risk of infection itself is higher in cancer patient. Also, I, uh, I just want to uh, mention uh, a study that was done by our uh, uh, researcher here in Rome, uh, because they showed that in effect, uh, cancer cells could be in some way even more resistant to uh, COVID infection in general. The problem, uh, is not if these patients are less sensitive or more sensitive. The problem is that when they get the infection, the risk of dying is certainly higher. Yeah. So that is why we need to protect these patients. So we cannot say that because uh, the risk, the, the, the possibility to have an infection because of the change in some receptor could be higher or lower, we cannot take any precaution for these patients. We absolutely need to take all the precaution for these patients because if they get the infection, the risk of that, of that is higher, certainly. And also there is a dramatic impact on management of these patients because uh, this is what I'm observing in my practice. I give you a very practical example. I saw at the beginning of September an ALK positive patient. So in this patient, uh, I mean, at that time, ALK status was not known, but I suspected that this patient was oncogene addicted because he was very young, never smoker, 
with a typical uh, sites of ALK positive patients. So the patient had a retinal localization, liver metastasis, and pleural effusion. So typical of ALK positive patients. This patient, uh, I, I proposed to this patient at the hospital. Finally, I received the information from the lab that he was ALK positive, and of course, uh, I cannot delay the onset of treatment. So we decided to not perform all the instrumental examination, all the staging procedures, including MRI and uh, that generally we do in our patients, and we deliver it direct, directly to the uh, to the home of the patient, uh, alectinib. So fortunately, he is starting the treatment, but was really a consistent risk that this patient, a young patient, didn't receive the treatment. That was possible because we have in our institution an organization for ensuring the treatment. But I believe that in small centers or in peripheral uh, centers, this is really an important risk for the patient. Okay. Bueno, eh, Vicente, eh, estamos en hora. Sí, pues nada, pues yo creo que si te parece, Mariano. We're, we're in time. So if you agree, Mariano, we can go to the next panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Caputo, for being here and for your presentation. So, Mariano, we can continue with our next panel which is immunotherapy in first line of non-small uh, cancer, non cell lung, non -small cell lung cancer in, uh, stage four. Moderators are Dr. Pilar Garrido and Irgueta Felipe. Thank you very much for your attention.